In our day-to-day -day life, we rely heavily on batteries. We utilize them when we use our phone, when we use our laptop, or when we start our car. To ensure their reliability, the manufacturers can test multiple metrics, such as the state of charge, which gives information on the capacity of the battery between charges, or the state of health, which compares the performance of the battery to that at its ideal condition before degradation. Unfortunately, inaccurate results when testing the quality of the electronics is common and fault diagnosis can be quite challenging. Electrochemical impedance spectroscopy, or EIS, is a method that can be used to monitor and test batteries. In practice, this technique can be applied to any system that responds to current. EIS investigates the properties of an electrochemical system through the lens of impedance, which can be thought of as the AC analog of resistance in a DC circuit. The magic of EIS is that it allows us both to study bulk and surface properties of our system through analogies to circuit elements, separating out the responses of different mechanisms in our system by the time constant of their response to perturbation. We treat our system as a black box and observe how its current responds to alternating potential or current signals over a range of frequencies. This response is called impedance, and the fact that we vary the frequency makes it a spectroscopy method. Practically, this means we can determine things like diffusion coefficients, kinetic parameters, and electrolyte resistance of our system. Before we get into the weeds of EIS analysis, let's establish what's happening in the cell. If we turned on the battery with the DC current, we might imagine the following happens in this order. The change in electrode potential is first felt at the electrode surface. Consequently, a double layer develops. Simultaneously, species begin to reduce or oxidize and migration kicks in due to charged species in the presence of an electric field. At later time, the reactant depletes of the electrode surface and concentration gradients form. Thus, diffusion begins to affect the performance of the battery. Overall, electron transfer starts to affect phenomena on different timescales from small to large. Note that the order of the, these processes depends strongly on the system, so take this as an example. Observing these events by turning on the electrode is difficult because they are short-lived. Quickly, electrochemical devices reach a pseudo-steady state where the DC current voltage relationship is dominated by fewer phenomena. However, applying an AC current or potential of different frequencies allows separation of events based on their timescales. In this example, we use an AC current with a frequency on the timescale of the reaction and the double layer formation. Because species convert rapidly between the reduced and oxidized form, a concentration gradient has no time to develop. Thus, diffusion effects on electric performance are not measured in the current response. The double layer capacitance and reaction rates control the current behavior. We can link these physical phenomena in the cell to the behavior of common circuit elements, which have different responses to alternating electrical signals. Impedance is used to characterize these differences, and its behavior relative to frequency is used to fit to equivalent circuit models to separate out the physics governing the system. So what is impedance? Impedance can be described as the alternating current analog of resistance to a DC signal. It represents the output electrical signal to AC input, a complex voltage divided by current where the magnitude of the ratio and the angle theta, the phase difference between the voltage and current, compose what impedance is. We can picture the real and imaginary parts of impedance as a vector as shown on a Nyquist plot. With the real part on the x-axis, the imaginary part can be plotted on the y-axis. The magnitude is the Euclidean distance of the vector composed of by real and imaginary parts, while the phase shift determines how much is real and how much is imaginary. A Bode plot can also represent the impedance with frequency on the x-axis and the amplitude or phase shift of the impedance on the y-axis. This animation shows how the data is related between the different graphs, where points of the same color are taken at the same frequency. Nyquist plots have many useful shapes that can be translated into equivalent circuit elements, which are very useful for analyzing equivalent circuit models, but they don't explicitly show the frequency of each point. 
In circuit models, there are a few different important elements. Resistors, which are purely real. Because they are purely real, there is no Y component on the Nyquist plot. These can be used to model electrolyte, polarization, charge transfer, and other resistances. Capacitors represent charge separation at an interface, so they're very useful for representing electrochemical components, such as double layers and grain boundaries. Their Nyquist plot has only a line parallel to the y-axis because they are purely imaginary. In addition, new elements were invented for electrochemical systems, such as Warburg impedance, which is used to model diffusion and electrolyte in batteries. Its Nyquist plot is a line in the form of y equals x. The last shown here is the constant phase element, which can describe non-uniform properties in real electrochemical systems. It is similar to capacitance, but with an exponential dependence. It is also linear on a Nyquist plot. It generally represents distribution of elements. Let's look at a very simple example of equivalent circuit fitting. Imagine that we could design an electrochemical cell whose only impedance is the electrolyte resistance. In that case, the potential current behavior can be modeled very simply using Ohm's law. In this case, the Nyquist plot would just be a point on the real axis, and the Bode plots would be horizontal lines. Now let's consider the case when the whole cell can be modeled by just what's going on at the interface. There's some charging of the double layer, which can be modeled as a capacitive current, and there's also a reaction happening, so there's some Faraday current. For the sake of simplicity, let's say this reaction can be modeled linearly, which isn't necessarily realistic, but for the moment means we can just represent the Faraday current as traversing a resistor. The capacitive current and reaction current are both occurring across the same potential drop, so they can be modeled in parallel as follows. To plot the Nyquist plot in this case, we can think about the limits with respect to frequency. At very high frequency, the impedance goes to zero, while at very low frequency, it approaches the Faradaic resistance. As a result, the Nyquist plot will be a semicircle. We can also plot Bode plots of the impedance magnitude versus frequency and the phase of the impedance versus frequency. Feel free to pause the video here and think about how the Nyquist plot could be translated into these Bode plots. In reality, it's likely that a cell's impedance would depend on both the solution resistance and the surface behavior. So we can consider both of the previous examples together. Because any charge passing through the cell experiences both the solution resistance and the surface impedance, they can be added in series. In this case, the equivalent circuit looks like this, and the Nyquist and Bode plots can be adjusted accordingly. This is a very simplified example, but it demonstrates how equivalent circuit fitting generally works. Elements in parallel occur at the same spatial location, whereas those in series are physically sequential. In real systems, solution resistance, which is opposition to ion migration, polarization resistance, which is the resistance from applied potential, and charge transfer resistance, which is also known as the resistance from electrochemical reaction kinetics, can all be modeled as resistors. On the other hand, double layer capacitance can be modeled as a capacitor. There are a few important caveats to keep in mind when working with EIS. First off, equivalent circuit fitting is difficult and only the simplest systems can be unambiguously matched to an equivalent circuit. Ideal circuit elements represent average bulk system properties that might not be totally faithful to distributed microscopic properties, and sometimes you can't accurately describe a system with a finite number of traditional circuit elements. Electrochemical systems are also inherently nonlinear, but impedance spectroscopy uses a linear assumption, which may not always be accurate. Now you can see why EIS can be so useful to study different electrochemical systems. That being said, its application is wide and it's not just restricted to classical electrochemical applications such as battery studies or corrosion characterization. Research has been done using EIS in sugar biosensors to study the difference between cancerous and normal cells, to characterize paint, and even to study the freshness of fish, to name a few. We hope this helps you get started on your EIS journey.